Hello, everyone and anyone, and welcome to the Veterinary Business Podcast, your ultimate resource for developing a successful veterinary practice and career. I am Dr. Peter Weinstein, one of the co-hosts of the Veterinary Business Podcast. Now, on this podcast, we bring you insights and expertise from industry-leading doctors, like the one we have today, experts and thought leaders. We cover a wide range of topics, including practice management, marketing strategies, leadership development, HR best practices, and much, much more. So, whether you're a practicing veterinarian, a practice owner, a practice manager, or just a wannabe student in studying to be a veterinarian, this podcast is tailored to help you navigate the rough waters and the unique challenges and opportunities in the business of veterinary medicine. Every listener of this podcast is welcome to visit the website at www.veterinarybusinessinstitute.com for additional resources and tools to support your growth. And remember, you can subscribe to our podcast on all of the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and anything else that hosts podcasts. Now, with all the formalities behind us, Jan, today, I am, I can't tell you how excited I am. I, I, this individual and I just reconnected after about 20 years, last year, maybe two years ago. I want to introduce you to Dr. Danny Rabwin, who is the founder of Ready Vet Go. And our topic today is mentoring and helping the next generation succeed. Danny, I can't tell you how excited I am to to be talking to you in, in this little format that we got. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. And it is thrilling to hear that you are so excited because um, I thought I was the one who was so excited. I mean, you've been somebody that I've known and admired for a long time. So I'm so grateful to be here. Thanks for asking. Yeah, it's, it's intriguing because um, I knew you when. I knew you when you were a veterinary student. <laughs> you sure did. And that was... <laughs> That was some time ago. We just got our save the date for our 20 year reunion. We graduated in 2004 and I met you the summer before I entered in the summer of 2000. Yeah, what what uh, what Danny isn't telling you is that I'm old. And in the summer of 2000, I had the great opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Don Klingborg and teach some leadership to veterinary students who were just entering the curriculum at UC Davis. What did you get out of that course? Did you get anything out of it besides like free lunch? (laughs) The free lunch was good. Um, (laughs) I got so much out of that course. You know, if I remember correctly, there was a group of us who was randomly selected to join that course as incoming veterinary students. And honestly, if it were an opt in leadership course at the time, I really don't think that I would have accepted that. I was not thinking about leadership. I was thinking about becoming a veterinarian. And I'm just so glad that I was just sort of voluntold that this was something that I was going to do. And it was a really wonderful way to um, be exposed to leadership with, you know, things that I learned from you. Um, And it also was a a wonderful bonding experience with a lot of the incoming students because it was a smaller group. One of my best friends to this day, Dr. Cindy Trice, the founder of Relief Rover, was also in that group. And that really solidified our relationship. Um, And so it just, it really set me on the right path. We learned a lot of skills. You know, I remember that at the beginning of veterinary school, when we were voting for various president or secretaries of our class, that most of those came from the leadership group, because we really learned a lot of skills about um, leadership and speaking up and team building. I remember some really fun team building exercises. Um, so I got a lot out of that incoming class. And of course, I got to meet you. And and then we didn't see each other for a long time and, and got to reconnect recently, which has just been so much fun. So this whole small world, and, and, and you know, you'll probably agree with this, is like just, there's like um, only one degree of separation in the veterinary profession. Mm-hmm. So a few years ago, I was at the Veterinary Innovation conference or summit or whatever it was called in um, uh, College Station. And I was taking the bus from the hotel back or towards the conference center where we were meeting. And a a woman across the aisle said, you probably don't remember who I am. And I said, you're right. (laughs) 
And she said, my name is <laughs> Trice, and you taught leadership to me as part of the program at UC Davis. I hadn't seen her since, you know, 2000 or thereabouts. And so Cindy introduced herself, and she was then just, I think, getting Relief Rover up and running. And then a couple of years later, you and Cindy were together at uh, that partners meeting, and that's how we reconnected. So... Um, when it, it just that's that one degree of separation mm -hmm. that, that we have in this profession and, and we'll get into some of your the work that you're currently doing but let, let's just give people a little bit of your backstory um because we have a lot of people in common but when did you just are you the classic barbie veterinarian did you grow up you knew you wanted to become a veterinarian and like yeah. you were six years old and you had all the stuffed animals and you wore a stethoscope and you listened to their stuffed animal hearts <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was. I love hearing stories of people who did not follow that. <laughs> what did you call it? The Barbie path of yeah. becoming a vet. Um, but that is not me. I I always wanted to be a veterinarian um, from the time I was really young. I would, you know, save the insects and had a little bug garden and in the yard and always wanted to accompany my parents to take the pets to the vet. And I really I loved animals, of course, but what I really loved was feeling like the vet consider the vet felt like a part of our family. And so, you know, I just remember being very young and one of our you know beloved dogs being euthanized. And this was back in the day where my dad would just take the dog and drop him off for euthanasia. Things have certainly changed. Um, but um, so I said goodbye and and wasn't there for the, the euthanasia. But that night we were sitting around having a family dinner and the phone rang and it was our family veterinarian. And he called to express his condolences to the family. And he specifically asked to get me on the phone because he knew that I was at every vet visit um, when our dog Sam was sick. And I got on the phone with him and I really I was young and I don't even really remember what the conversation was, but I hung up the phone and I announced to my family, I'm going to be like him when I grow up. And it was so much about that connection with the family veterinarian that I really craved. I am a people person. Um, I love animals, but what I've really come to learn over the years is that helping animals and being a veterinarian is really, for me, a way to actually connect with people. And so that might be where my story is a little bit different than other people who are drawn to veterinary medicine from a young age. Um, I do love animals, but it's the people part that really drew me into it. And it's what's fueled me throughout my my 20 years. So you, um, and, and again, Danny, you and I haven't really talked much about what the last 20 years look like. There was pre-vet school, just about to go in as a freshman. And then there's 20 years later, and there's this huge gap where in my life, you didn't exist. So <laughs> Thanks a lot, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but now that you're back in my life, help bring me up to speed. So what happened after you walked down the aisle and got a, a tassel and, and you got a piece of cardboard that said, doctor of veterinary medicine, tell me a little bit about yeah. life after graduation. Yeah. So life after graduation was me doing an internship. I will take a step back though, before I walked down that aisle and I got that tassel, my clinical year was spent at the teaching hospital, loving every rotation that I did. And I was convinced that general medicine was for me. I wanted to be a general practitioner. I also would hear sometimes, you know, in the clinic halls, oh, you're so good at this or that. Why don't you go into this specialty or you're so good at this? Why are you going into general practice? And it really kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I thought, well, aren't these the people we actually want in general practice? And so I really wanted a little bit of extra training with an internship. Um, some of that we can talk about, you know, with me being a mentor now and with Ready Vet Go with a mentorship program. Um, but I wanted to make sure that I had the kind of training that I felt like I really needed before I went into general practice. And I wanted to go to um, a, a do an internship at a place that really supported me being a general practitioner. And in those days, we did not start our clinics right at the beginning of summer. We had the summer off. And so I took the summer and I drove cross country and I spent a couple of days at many different specialty clinics 
um, just hanging out and kind of interviewing them and <laughs> seeing if they were supportive of people doing an internship with the goal of going into general practice. And I found one that really did. And I matched with them. That was Michigan Veterinary Specialists. I think they're a blue pearl now. And it was a great experience for me. And and then I went into private practice. I moved back to Southern California where I was from. And I took a job at a group of three clinics. One was a 24-hour clinic. It was a day practice and emergency overnight. And then there were two little satellite one doctor practices owned by our mutual friend, um, Mike Buffum. And it was an incredible experience for me. I had some amazing mentors. It was an independently owned group of practices, and they were really invested in my mentorship journey. And because it was 24 hours, I was able to work both day practice and pick up some overnight shifts. And that was really fun for me. And I had a lot of energy back then and um, would just mix up my weeks with day practice and an overnight here and there. And and then I ended up staying there. I worked at one of the satellite practices, which was a one doctor practice. They were growing. That was um, that was Buff's practice. And he brought me on um, to work mostly in that clinic, um, which was wonderful. I was with that group for about eight or nine years. I like to stay in one place and work at the same clinic and really cultivate relationships with pet owners and my teams. And um, after that, I moved up to the Bay Area um, for some family changes and ended up taking a job at a clinic where I still work and I've been there going on 11, well, it's 11 years now. And again, I just like to stay put and, and cultivate relationships. And throughout that time, because of my experience in the Southern California clinic working emergency, I've just stayed in love with emergency and have picked up uh, emergency relief shifts here and there over the years just to kind of stay on top of things and make sure that I'm not losing my skills and really just kind of, you know, branching out and making sure that I'm not staying in just um, one area. And then I don't know how much you want me to keep going, but yep, then suddenly good. I was compelled to start a mentorship program. So that, that's where I am now. Let, let's, uh, let's visit the one degree of separation again. So about a month ago, maybe less, uh, Mike Buffum gave me a call. Now, Mike likes to call me and just suck the life out of me for about an hour <laughs> on anything. Um, yeah. He, he has no shortage of things to say. But this time he specifically called and said, I love Danny. She's her program is just so wonderful. Do you know Danny Rabin? I said, I let Mike go on and on and on for, yeah. well, probably felt like an hour, but it was probably only about three or four minutes. And I said, uh, Mike, Danny and I are going to be doing a podcast in the next few weeks. We've known each <laughs> other since she was in veterinary school. And I love Danny and I love her messaging. And um, so I said, but, you know, it's nice to hear you. And then we started to talk about you and mentoring and and um, and his experiences mentoring you. And, and so there's, again, another example of the one degree of separation. And we if we played a little bit of veterinary tag, I could probably figure out who you work for in the Bay Area. But we won't do that right now. But I think it's been fun to to shout out to uh, Mike Buffum and Cindy Trice and some of the others who have um kind of bridged the gap in 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 our lifetimes um from that standpoint and, and and even though we've got you know a couple of decades between us in terms of age it just goes to show that it it's this profession is really a, a intertwined network of people that um you got to be careful what you say to whom because it may come back and and either kick you in the butt or help kiss your butt when it comes down to it so it's so true. It's such a small world and it really is such a one degree of separation. And it's also just filled with so many good people is what I'm learning. You know, I just, I'm, I just love to collect people in my network because obviously I like people, but I think this profession attracts a certain type of person that I really connect with generally good hearted people. And even somebody like, you know, Mike Buffum, who, um, you know, we are of different generations and our practice style was very different. He was the best, like first person to mentor me after my internship because he was 
and is so warm and caring and, you know, had a style all his own. And sometimes I found it, you know, incredibly annoying as a new veterinarian, he, he would often come into my exam room and um, pull me out of the room and say, Danny, come in here. I need you to meet so-and-so. And he would introduce me to Mrs. Smith and he would say, Mrs. Smith, this is our new associate, Dr. Rablin, and she's young and she's new and she knows everything. And when I'm not here, Fluffy's going to be in really good hands. Okay, Danny, you can go back to your room. And I would just <laughs> consider it such a burden. And it now I know it was such a gift. You know, his instinct was spot on. And it was such a gift to really elevate me in the eyes of these families who he had worked with for 30 years and who weren't about to just trust the new person. And, and they did. They immediately trusted me. I built my client list very quickly. And, you know, there's some real benefit to learning from somebody who has a different communication style and a different way of treating patients. You know, it, it, it was just a really wonderful relationship. So I, I love our, our one degree of separation game um, with all the amazing people we have in common. Yeah, it's um, it's nice to have somebody bless you like Mike did for the clients. I, I think it mm -hmm. is such an integral part of helping young doctors be successful. And, you know, you had an entrepreneurial seizure in the recent past, which, <laughs> um, which did you take on uh, a new role, a new task, a new dream that in many cases continues to, to pass on or, or um, push forward what Mike did for you. And so what was it, what happened, what, what got under your skin that said, I got to do something else besides just be a clinician? So what, what was your epiphany that changed you from just kind of squeezing anal glands and, um, mm -hmm. you know, doing itchy dogs and vomiting and diarrhea? What, 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 what came over you? Yeah, something definitely came over me. It was like a fast moving train that I just could not stop because boy, was I happy with anal glands and skin and vomiting diarrhea. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I was not looking for a new career path. I came upon it. it. It moved through me and it, you know, I just, I've always loved mentoring and in the, the clinics where I've worked and when I'm visiting in other clinics as a relief vet, I always kind of naturally take on the mentoring role and, you know, the epiphany came for me during the summer of 2020, the pandemic summer, the practice where I'm currently working, hired a new grad. And she was a, a UC Davis grad in the summer of 2020. And we had a small doctor's office and her desk was right next to mine. And I got to hear her all day on the phone with her clients. And we became very close. We had a, a really wonderful um, pretty formal mentor mentee relationship. It was understood when she started that I would take on a lot of the mentoring role and it was a great relationship. I learned from her. She learned from me. And after a few months of her working at our clinic, she began to come to me with questions that I knew were not her own cases because I knew all of her cases since we were so intimately uh, connected in the doctor's office and it turns out that she was asking on behalf of friends and classmates who were out in practice and were not receiving a similar type of support that she was. And she um, would come with questions um, for me to answer for them. And I said, well, this is just silly. You know, it's pandemic summer. We're all used to being on Zoom. Why don't we just form a Zoom group and let's they can just ask me their questions directly. And so we did. We formed this impromptu Zoom group. And it was myself facilitating these monthly or twice a month phone calls with new and early career veterinarians. A classmate of ours, one of mine, uh, who was an equine practitioner, a very good friend of mine, got wind of what we were doing. She was transitioning into small animal practice. And she said, hey, I went in on that. So she came on board and we had this really wonderful group and we would, we would meet, we'd all finish our shifts, we'd go home, we'd get a glass of wine or a tea or whatever. And they would bring cases. And we would talk about their cases. And we formed this really amazing community. It was a lot of camaraderie and collegiality. And some themes started to emerge, which is that, yes, they would all come with a medical case. But the truth is they all knew the medicine. You know, if they were having trouble managing a diabetic, it wasn't necessarily because they didn't know how to manage a diabetic. It was because now this diabetic patient is attached to a human who has values and beliefs 
and schedules that may not account for twice a day insulin injections. They might have um, physical limitations where they can't administer the medication. There were budgets to be mind mindful of. They wanted to know how to efficiently get in and out of exam rooms. And so these themes started to emerge that were really actually not clinical. And I started to realize that a lot of the support that these new veterinarians needed could number one, be done remotely, which is kind of a new way of thinking about mentorship. And also they were non-clinical and they were not a lot of the things that are taught in many veterinary schools. They were the things that after almost 20 years in practice, the things that I love and that have helped fueled me and keep me as such a cheerleader for this profession for so many years is things that are teachable, ways to connect with clients, ways to communicate, ways to be a leader in the practice. And I just had this aha moment, like, I want to do this. I want to help as many new veterinarians learn these skills that I'm now um, passing along and, and working out with these new veterinarians as I can. And I just looked around to see if there was any type of remote program that existed teaching these things, helping promote new veterinarians, helping bond new grads to their practice, you know, decreasing turnover, helping them understand their role that they played in the financial health of the practice. Um, and I couldn't find anything that was as comprehensive as what I was envisioning. And I just decided, you know, I guess I'm the one to do this. And, um, and so I did, I spent the next year building out the curriculum that I thought that I would teach in my mentorship program. And I launched it with a group of eight veterinarians out here in the Bay area in spring of 2022. And slowly, but surely people have been getting wind of what we're doing and we have, we have grown and grown and it's been really amazing. So here I am as an entrepreneur and still working a couple of days a week in the clinic and, and, and loving it. Well, happy anniversary. It's now two years. Yeah, you're right. It is. It is exactly. Thank you. Give me chills. Yes. Ah, very cool. Well, I, um, I will celebrate Memorial Day weekend, uh, 38 years after graduating. So, uh, it gets, wow. you get, you, you, you start oh. to look back and try to remember what happened in the last exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. So the word mentor, mentoring, mentorship, I, I almost feel has been abused and used in this profession to the point that it has lost some of its value. And I apologize, but that's just what you see, because I think there's a lot of quote unquote false advertising when it comes down to it. What does mentoring mean to you? It's such a good question because it is a really hot topic and it is a buzzword and we do see it thrown around a lot. Um, you know, to me, there are so many different definitions of mentoring. Um, to me, it really is a relationship that is supportive where an experienced individual can nurture, guide, um, empower a new veterinarian. Um, Actually, I, sh I should pause and say that new veterinarian is not not the right word because I have so many mentors in my life now. Um, but it's somebody who's really invested in um, not only the professional growth, but also I think the personal growth of the person that they are mentoring. It's about being authentic and open, um, providing in encouragement. Um, so those are some of the words that I think of when I think of mentoring. I presented a webinar last night and I shared my definition of mentoring, which I always use, which has three words, which is intentional, consistent, and collaborative. And I was presenting this talk to the Relief Rover community. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I have to be honest with you. I'm using the definition of mentorship that I always use whenever I talk about it. And I had to pause when I put this definition in, knowing that I was presenting to relief veterinarians because it was the consistency piece that hung, that I got hung up on. And I had to really sit back and ask myself, 
what does consistency mean in a mentoring relationship? Because I know from being, you know, visiting in a clinic for um, one day as a relief vet, there is a mentorship experience that can happen in a short period of time. And I had to, you know, ask myself, is it more about quality over quantity? And I turned it back to the community and I said, hey, just think about this and send me an email later if you have thoughts on this, because um, I also want to be open to evaluating what mentoring is. Um, but those are some of the words and some of the language that I use when I think about mentoring. You know, it, it, it the third word, collaborative, is the word that I get hung up on. Mm. Because way too much in the way of mentoring is one person talking down to another mm. it's, it, it, it and that's that's the interpretation that many people have in a practice setting everything i've read everything i know and everything i talk about when i talk about mentoring is it is a two-way street and it's equal give and take that's the collaborative component of it but way too many of our colleagues are not really mentoring as much as really teaching, but they're not seeking the other half. They're not listening to what the needs are of the mentee. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's that's where I see the shortfalls are, is the collaborative component. I couldn't agree with you more. I think we forget about the collaborative component. And I will sometimes even see mentorship agreements that are presented to vet students when they graduate from a potential employer where everything is spelled out about the, what the mentoring relationship will look like. And I, you know, I have to ask myself, like, where is the input from the mentee in this agreement? And one of the first things we do in our mentorship program is we do a mentee skills training where we empower the mentee to take accountability for their own learning and to be proactive in their own learning. And in our ReadyVetGo mentorship program, the mentors that we bring on um, to support the mentees, you know, I let them know you are going to do a lot more listening than you are talking because it's not just about us passing along um, how we would do something. It's an art. And we want to help empower mentees to create their own authentic version of practicing, whatever that looks like for them. And I just get so much joy in, in sitting back when I'm working with mentees and just watching them talk to each other. And I'll chime in as needed. But, you know, I really recommend that mentors approach their mentoring relationship from a place of curiosity. And I kind of heard that in your question, you know, asking questions and really listening um, so that we can help be guides rather than just teach how to unblock a cat or, you know, and all of those things are important and we need those as well. Um, but it is much more nuanced and, and rich than that. One of the, in, in my opinion, there are three significant shortfalls in the average veterinary business. Lack of leadership, poor communication, and a failure to focus on training. Mm. So when it comes down to a mentoring program or a mentoring mentorship agreement, it really starts at the top, which means that the person at the top, the leader, assuming there is one, because there is a lot of practices that have owners, but not leaders, mm -hmm. has to believe that they want to have a positive influence and create a great colleague in their practice. And I think one of the challenges that you have in Ready, Bet, Go and, and that we have as a profession is the lack of understanding of what leadership is and that the real goal of a leadership is to make their followers even more successful than the leader themselves. And that is really the ultimate outcome from a mentoring standpoint. Now, you yeah. had some amazing opportunity when you were just entering vet school with some bizarre <laughs> program. Um, what's your take? I mean, do you have the same feeling in, in the experiences that you've had in talking to other veterinarians and, and talking to the young mentees that we have some leadership issues in this profession? I, I do think so. Um, and I'm glad there's people like you out there trying to help with that. 
we do have some leadership issues. One of the reasons that veterinary clinics enroll their new associates in an outside mentorship program with us is to help navigate some of those challenges. A medical director at a, a big corporate group referred to us as a safe island, that we are a place where their new associates can come to talk about some of the challenges that they are having with leadership. And one of the things that, that we do is we really empower the new grads to come up with their own language that, you know, feels good to them to talk to their leaders. And sometimes as the mentee, they're the ones who, who help, you know, move the leadership forward um, because they're using some of their own tools and skills. And yes, that's the, the long way of saying, yes, I agree. There is often a leadership challenge. I don't know that I really know exactly why that is. Um, I do have some of my, my own thoughts. Um, I would be curious to know yours um, about where that comes from. But I think that, that yes, that is a concern. And like many things, there are teachable skills to help empower leaders to become better leaders. Um, I've had to learn those as the founder of my own business. You know, I when I started this, I thought I was going to be the only mentor. And that quickly changed because so many people wanted to be enrolled in the program. And I have very strict requirements for my mentors. And I'm extremely proud of the mentor group that we have. One of the things that um, we had to work out was, you know, when I when I match mentors with a group of mentees to meet over the course of six months, some of the mentors wanted very specific guidance on how to run their, we call them PAC meetings, on how to run their PAC meetings. And one of the things that I learned was um, a, a personal philosophy of mine is that if I don't really take advantage of the unique gifts and wisdom of the mentee mentors that I bring on, this program will suffer because there's no way that with my experience, um, my own biases, my own background, that somehow I'm going to be the be all end all of building out an amazing mentorship program. And while that was hard for some mentors to um, take the lead with their own groups, man, it has really served us well. And so I've learned a lot about leadership. And, um, and I think that, you know, was in your question a little bit. It's, I, I think that is, is really important to tap into people's gifts and experience. So you, uh, you intimated that you had a thought as to why we have leadership issues and you thought <laughs> you probably were looking at me saying, okay, what's your thought? Um, <laughs> yes. I think if we look back at veterinary medicine from an evolutionary standpoint, that to get into veterinary school, you had to do well in high school. You had to you have, had to have a feeling of what you were doing. And to get do well in high school, in most high schools, you have to do it by yourself. And then you get into an undergraduate program. And you know to get into veterinary school, you need to do well. And most of your friends and uh, cohorts look at you like you're crazy for getting up and cleaning kennels on a Saturday morning when you should be studying. So a lot of veterinary medicine in high school, because I worked on weekends and during the week, and as an undergrad, is done by yourself. And then you get into veterinary school. Mm. Well, let's take a look at something. Do you think a curriculum and a faculty at a veterinary school want people that are disruptive or want people that are followers because mm -hmm. they want you to sit in your seat and get force fed, tube fed content. So mm -hmm. I would argue, and I, you know, if, if any of the deans of the veterinary schools, and I teach at a veterinary school, want to argue with me, I'll be more than happy to do so. I think we add, we select against leaders to go to veterinary school because leaders need followers. And we have done everything so much on our own throughout un high school undergrad getting in that it's rare to find real leaders getting into veterinary school unless they were on a sports team or unless they ran some clubs 
Um, so we now take a whole bunch of individuals and put them in a class and teach them individually. And it really almost, we almost select against, and, and I think it's pretty obvious when you look at how difficult some of the clubs have in finding presidents of the club or chairs of the club. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we graduate a lot of followers instead of a lot of leaders. And even with leadership training, I think there's a lot of hesitancy for veterinary students to question what's going on because there's an intimidation factor, not a collaboration factor in veterinary school. You don't question the faculty. You don't question the dean. There was a, a, um, an article written by a former dean at the vet school in Saskatchewan, which is also known as Western University, about mentoring should start in vet school and preparation for mentoring should start in vet school, which means that the faculty have to be mentoring the students and vice versa. So there's my explanation as to why we have a leadership problem. Oh, and by the way, then we open our own practices by ourselves. And to me, all you're doing is, is creating this continuum of individuality. The average veterinary hospital size in the United States is 2.2 doctors. So really the vast majority of those are owned by individuals. Mm. And the biggest challenge in my opinion, in terms of mental health is working by yourself because you don't have a colleague or somebody to collaborate with or talk to cases about Etc. So there's my unscientific opinion, and of course, you know, I have lots of opinions about why we are where we are. I think it's such an interesting thought, and I don't know that I had thought about it exactly like that, but that does resonate with me. You know, even just when you were talking, I just was remembering being 15 years old and showing up at the clinic where I worked at the end of the day, because my job was to go through and clean the clinic and buff and wax the floors by myself at 15. And so that really just hit home for me when you said that, um, that is what we're doing when we're trying to get into veterinary school. Um, so there is that kind of individual piece, which I think is really interesting and about, you know, being followers versus leaders. I don't know that I had thought of it so much that way. Um, I often think of the competitive nature of going to veterinary school. And it's definitely something that I hear from mentees, you know, a big part of our mentorship program is very collaborative. And I had a mentee share with me, she was very vulnerable and said, this is very hard for me. I have been trained from the get-go to be competitive with my peers and colleagues because we're fighting for positions in school, we're fighting for internships and residencies, and now suddenly I'm graduated and you're asking me to be, you know, collaborative with everybody. And that is really hard. And I just was so grateful to her that she gave me that feedback. And it makes me think that that very first question you asked me about how we met and how did that leadership program like affect me and what did I learn? I, I really think that, starting off that veterinary school with those collaborative relationships had to have helped. I remember doing a ropes course with you. I had never done a ropes course before. And that was very memorable. And only now as I'm talking to you, do I realize like maybe that really did help even more than I knew. It's so interesting to hear you say that. I'm wondering like there are some veterinary schools who I think are trying to change this and they're, they are more collaborative. And I'm wondering, you know, if you think that that's helping. Well, as you, as you know, at Western, they do problem-based learning. So they have small group case management. And mm -hmm. I think it does help. I think it, it creates students who are better communicators. And remember one of the issues that I talked about earlier is lack of leadership, poor communication and lack of training. So I do think that, that problem-based learning is a good way of, of solving together a problem. Veterinary medicine is a team sport, okay? Mm -hmm. We grew up, and, and I don't know how much you know about rowing and crew, but there are boats with one person in the boat. And that's how we grow up. And mm -hmm. then you graduate and there are seven others in the boat that you have mm -hmm. to build a cadence with. So everybody is stroking at the same time, but you've never had to depend on other people for your cadence. And now you have to. 
as an associate. Even as the owner who is at the head of the boat saying stroke, stroke, you have to help build that cadence. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's a visual that I use when I speak a lot about where we were and where we are, because it's all about getting everybody to, to work together towards a common vision, a common mission, common core values, a common set of goals. And we are not very good at it because the, our goal was get into a good undergrad, do well in undergrad, yeah. get into vet school. And then once you're yeah. in vet school, it's to graduate. So I, I really am a big advocate that we should be doing testing as a group. Have four people come together and, and look to, to create the answers to the test as a group. Why don't we have more group projects? Uh, MBA programs tend to have more group projects because our lives are not about us as individuals. They are about the people that you surround yourself with and helping each other become more successful. And essentially, that's what a mentoring relationship is about. It's helping mm -hmm. somebody else become more successful. But this is an interview with you. Why am I doing all the talking? <laughs> I'm taking advantage of having you to myself for an hour. I'm sorry. I've shifted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's OK. Now I have to ask you a question. OK. <laughs> where, where, where did the name Ready Vet Go come from? Um, that is a really good question. I was uh, very excited to come up with that name. Um, I will say that it wasn't just me. It was a friend who is very clever. And I shared with this friend, you know, what my, my business was going to be. And we had talked about, um, you know, among my family and friends, as I was coming up with this idea, something about Dr. Danny. Um, but we, there's a, another, there is a, a prominent Dr. Danny McVetty in our field. And I thought, well, everyone kind of knows her, so I can't do that. Um, so what kind of a name should I use? And so I shared it with this friend and this friend said, well, I'm about to get on a plane. I get a lot of inspiration in the air. <laughs> and um, and he landed and he, he suggested, he said, how about this? I said, I wanted something kind of whimsical. And, um, and so that name was proposed to me and I just immediately jumped on it. I just thought that is so perfect. You know, we're really setting people up to move forward in this profession. And it just completely resonated with me. And I jumped on it and and loved it. I, I think it's a very cool name. And there's so many different things that you can do with it um, oh, yeah. as you continue to grow your um, your vision. Yeah, lots of potential for growth. Yep. So, so let's just talk about mentoring. And, and um, so if I think back to the leadership program and all the times that I've been up to Davis and, and Western and all the different veterinary schools, um, I think the term mentor started to kind of enter in the veterinary uh, lingo jargon significantly 10 years ago, but it escalated dramatically uh, maybe within the last five years. And, and maybe even the pandemic exacerbated it. Um, what do you think happened that all of a sudden mentoring is the number one thing that graduate veterinarians are looking for in their first job? What was it that just all of a sudden pushed mentoring from, yeah, it's a nice to have to, and, and, you know, and actually I have a talk that I do, uh, is there life after vet school? And one of the slides is, you know, you should be looking for mentoring. The only problem is we can't define it. Um, so mm. what, do, what do you think has pushed mentoring from, well, let's just talk about it in dark alleys and not make it a public discussion to being front and center in the veterinary profession? That's a really good question. I mean, I feel like we were talking about it, but maybe not quite as prominently as we are now. You know, like you said, it's, it's the number one thing that veterinary students and new grads want when they look for a first job. It's also the number one reason they cite when they leave their first job, because lack of mentorship contributes to a really super high number of vets leaving their first job within the first year. Um, somewhere between, I usually say 30%, but I read a, a recent study that suggested potentially up to 44% of new grads leaving their first job within the first year. And so I think that turnover piece is potentially part of the reason why mentorship is being discussed so much. You know, I look back on when I graduated and, you know, we talked about 
um, Mike Buffum at the beginning of this talk. And the way I was mentored by him was pretty typical for those of us who were lucky enough to have a buff. He was a sp essentially a solo practitioner in Southern California, and he'd built up his practice over many years. And it really behooved him and his business to make sure that I fit in well with the practice and that I practiced good medicine and that I connected with his clients. And it was in his personal best interest to make sure that I succeeded. Yes, he cared about me as a new veterinarian, but I think there also was this other incentive. And I think that has changed. Um, you know, the, the ownership structure of practices has really changed over the last many years. And I think that that might be contributing to it as well. The, the old days of, you know, everything being independently owned and for independent practitioners to kind of onboard their new associate that, that has really changed. Um, and I think there's a lot more discussion about wellness and burnout and mental health and a lot of that can be addressed through mentorship. And so maybe it was like what you were saying, it was sort of behind the shadows and it wasn't really talked about. Now it's just being discussed more. Um, but I think we're really acknowledging that this is what, what new and early career veterinarians really need is that kind of support. And, and it's changing, you know, there's generational changes. Um, I sometimes hear from experienced veterinarians that, well, I don't want to hire a new grad. They just want their hands held. And I am out there to really try and change that belief because I don't believe that at all. You know, we've just talked about how hard you have to work often by yourself to get through veterinary school. These are not people who want their hands held, um, but they do need guidance and, and support. Yeah, I, they don't want their hands held, but they would like somebody to hold the light so they can see where they're going. I love that. I'm stealing it and I'm putting it in my pocket. <laughs> You're more than welcome to use it. So um, what's a good mentor look like? A good mentor is someone who is open and empathetic. I think that is sort of, it comes with the territory with a lot of veterinarians. I think vets are very good at being empathetic. I think we're not always as good at expressing our empathy. So being able to express that empathy, being able to be a good active listener, you know, we talk about that, about letting the mentee kind of drive that relationship and really sitting back and listening. I think a good mentor is somebody who is curious. Again, I think that as veterinarians, we are, are inherently pretty curious people, you know, just to get us into and through veterinary school. And then we get out and we sort of lose that curiosity sometimes and or we don't apply that curiosity to other people. And so, um, you know, empathetic, a good listener, a curious person, I think is um, are some of the things that I think of um, to make a good mentor. Um, I think a good mentor is also somebody who is open to learning things from their mentee. You know, a sex successful mentoring relationship is a two-way street. I didn't learn how to spay a rabbit until I had a mentee who had just spent quite a bit of time at a shelter and was very proficient at spaying a rabbit. And that was really fun for me. And if I wasn't a mentor, I wouldn't have known that we don't say HGE anymore. Apparently that has changed, uh, but I needed a mentee to tell me that. <laughs> wow, there goes goes. I just learned something. So, <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> we we need to be mentors to stay relevant. <laughs> yeah, they. You know, I think sometimes there are there are researchers who just change the names of things so they have job security. Um, <laughs> so we know what a mentor looks like, but what would a good mentee look like? Again, I would say a good mentee is someone who is eager to learn. And this ties back to leadership. You know, I don't think that these are mutually exclusive things. I think, you know, I'm giving a talk at AVMA coming up about, you know, transitioning from being a, a learner to a leader. And I think they're very intimately connected and really understanding how um, 
one can take their mentorship journey into kind of a leadership space, I think is really important. And for all the reasons that we've talked about, that isn't necessarily that comes very naturally to um, mentees, but being able to really take initiative, be proactive for their own learning. You know, one of the things that I do to change the narrative about mentees and new grads wanting their hands held is a pr- the exact program that you referenced from the Western College in Saskatchewan. I have adapted that mentee skills training that they used in their vet school into a um, course that I teach at the beginning of my mentorship program which teaches mentees to take accountability for their own learning. We give them tools to become self-directed learners. We empower them to move their mentorship journey forward. And so um, some of the things that I think make for a good mentee can be taught. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that we can get some of that information into more of the veterinary schools, Um, but at least it's something that um, that I try and impart to any mentee that I come into contact with. I'm so excited that you actually looked at the Saskatchewan mentorship program. <laughs> I, I thought I was the only one in the freaking world who had found that program and read about it. So it's two nope. thumbs up on that. So I actually spoke to uh, the former dean uh, and I talked to him about it and some other things too. So it's very cool. Well, um, I, will, I will give a shout out to another wonderful mentor of mine who is the medical director and was the longtime practice owner of the practice where I work here in the Bay Area. It's Arnie Gutleiser. And he he knew what I was doing with building out my mentorship program. And um, he frequently will find things that the doctors who work for him are interested in, in various journals, and he will circle them and he will leave them on our desk with his initials. And that is a wonderful mentoring tip um, that you know I'd like to pass along. He asks us what we're interested in. He gets to know us. He's you know the leader in the clinic and then does what many good mentors do, which is provide resources for um, helping move people in the direction that they want to go. So he found it. He circled it. He left it on my desk. And it really changed the course of my own um, mentorship program because it's at the beginning of, of all of my mentorship programs now. So um, so right, there were a few that. of us who, who who read that. And I'm yeah. really grateful that they, they published that for us. I like that guy. I, never, I don't know if I met him, but I like that guy. I'll make um, an intro. One person you do not know. It's shocking. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two kids. I believe you have one. I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... A lot of what you're talking about from a mentoring standpoint parallels parenting, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I think Mm -hmm. the skills of being a good parent have a lot to do with listening and empathy and hearing the other side and not being accusatory and being malleable and flexible. Um, Maybe we should maybe we should have some mentoring courses for parents as well. <laughs> um, no, I mean I look back and my kids are both grown up and and uh, off the payroll, but it's really interesting to look at mentoring as it's and its parallels with parenting. What do you think? I think that resonates with me so deeply right now, Peter. My son is graduating high school in a month, and so I am really leading up to this kind of pre-empty nest situation. And it's affected me in an emotional way where I feel like I'm at a place now where, you know, I've kind of, I've done the things that I can do to help form him into the human that he is. And now I get to sit back and I get to watch him thrive and grow and you're going to make me cry. Um, I, I wrote a blog a few months ago about um, how to navigate the place in every mentoring relationship where the mentee differs from their mentor in how they want to manage a case or handle some situation. And what I say in that blog is this is a great time for the mentor to sit back and go, hooray, I did my job. You know, I have helped you become so confident that you can now step into your own. And so the parallels, it's such an insightful question and it's so meaningful for me at this particular moment. I had my my first college stress dream about my kid leaving the other night. And so, um, and like many questions that you've posed in this chat that we've had today, they're, they're, they're super insightful with the connections that I don't know that I had even 
recognize myself, but I would say that there's definitely a lot of overlap. Well, I mean, we could go on and on and I would love to, um, but I want to respect your time. And um, man, we could talk about the, my lack of mentoring when I graduated, my daughter's lack of mentoring, even oh. though it was in her contract uh, oh. for her first job. So and sad. I, I think that the messaging that I have, and, and I think you have as well, is that we, and when I say we, it's the global veterinary profession, have the opportunity to define what our future looks like. And the best way to do that is to provide the tools, the resources, and the support on both sides so that the mentor and the mentee are working intentionally, consistently, and collaboratively to the common good, which is to improve not just the individual, but the profession as a whole. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. That's that's where my heart is. It's with both the individual veterinarian and this profession that I just love so much. It's given me so much and has provided me with so many amazing people in my life and um, allowed me to be where I am now on this mentorship journey. So where do you see the future of the veterinary profession? What does it look like in your eyes? Mm. Well, this always has been and I think will continue to be a pretty amazing profession. You know, we attract really wonderful people. And, you know, I think there's, I don't want to sugarcoat over some of the challenges that we're having, like some of the things you mentioned around leadership and um, sort of how we select for um, who goes into veterinary school. But I think the truth is, no matter where this profession goes, we are attracting amazing, empathetic, kind people. You know, you and I have vet partners in common, and there's a lot of people who support the veterinary profession who are not veterinarians. And I love networking with them and finding out how they ended up working in support of the veterinary profession, you know, whether that's an accountant or an architect or um, an attorney whose entire business is around supporting the veterinary profession. And they always say the same thing, like, well, I used to do this in with X profession or Y profession. And then I had my first contract with a veterinarian and it was the most wonderful people I'd ever worked with. And I think that that will stay true um, no matter where we go. This profession will always attract a certain um, quality of person who is kind and empathetic and caring. And I think that um, that keeps me very hopeful and positive for this profession. So Ready Vet Go is still a baby. It's mm -hmm. still, it's, it's, maybe it's learning to walk. Where do you, <laughs> what, what, what does Ready Vet Go look like in a perfect world in the future? Well, in a perfect world in the future, every student who graduates veterinary school asks for participation in the Ready Vet Go mentorship program as part of their sign on package so that they know that even if there is outstanding mentorship and support in their clinic, they will also have a very robust group to support them during that really important transition from veterinary school into practice. So I've got I've got big ambitions for this program. Um, we also are growing outside of just the new grad community. We have what we call the RVG community, which is a place for veterinarians and veterinary professionals really at any stage in their career to network with each other, to find um, organic mentorship. Um, we provide race-approved continuing education on topics that appeal to lots of veterinarians, new grads um, in particular. Um, and so really just helping um, empower veterinarians at many stages in their career. And ultimately what I want, and, and the reason that I think that even though we are just learning how to walk in this stage of the, the growth of this business, we learned how to walk pretty quickly. We had to, because people are responding to something that we are doing. You know, we hit on something really important at the right time. Mentorship obviously is important, but we are leading with our core value of joy for this profession. And people are responding to that. 
And it is not to sugarcoat over some of the challenges that we have in the veterinary profession, but it's to let people know that this um, this is a fun profession. This is joyful. There are amazing people. We get to help animals. We get to help families. And that message really resonates. And um, it's how I've practiced over the last 20 years. It's sort of how I live my, my life. And to be able to touch so many people in this profession that I love so much has been, it's been a real joy. It's something I say joy a lot. Um, it's, it's, it's something that I, that I live by. And so hopefully in the future, this will be a part of, of every new veterinarian's career journey. Hey, you know, I had a, so many other things that I want to get into, but uh, we're not going to, because what you just <laughs> said is so good to wrap up on. Aww, and, it, and, it, and it, and it, um, it makes me feel good because I I had a small impact on you 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't always know what impact some of the stuff I do has because you don't always get to talk to somebody down the road. You know, every mm -hmm. once in a while, I get an email, I get a text, you run into somebody like Cindy on a bus. <laughs> um, and then I get to talk to you and it's like, you know, you've done some good work, doc. And you got people who are out there continuing to bring the message forward. So Dr. Danny Radwin, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter Weinstein. This has been a joy and you did have an impact on me 24 years ago and you still do. And you probably do with more people than you know. Well, Thank you so much, Danny, for joining us today and talking to us about mentoring and, and helping the next generation succeed. Uh, we appreciate it. I also want to take a moment to thank our listeners. Uh, we appreciate each and every one of you. We can't do what we do without you. If you like our podcast, kindly share it with your colleagues and friends on social media. Write it on the back of the bathroom door, wherever you share your information. Also, please don't forget to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Your reviews will help other doctors and practice owners and students and managers find us. Until next time, keep striving for excellence and making positive impact in the lives of your patients and pet parents. And to quote Danny Rabwin, bring joy to the world. Mm. Wishing you all this an amazing week ahead. Thank you.